Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, which is titled uh, AI and Matters of the Heart, where we'll talk about the use and benefits of AI, uh, specifically in cardiology. Uh, we are lucky to be ac accompanied by a panel of experts from our platform partners. Uh, first of all, we'll do a quick uh, round of introductions. I'll be moderating uh, today's session, so let me start. Uh, so my name is Rahil Shahzad. I'm a biomedical engineer, and I have a PhD in cardiac image analysis, and I've worked with cardiac CT and MR in the past. Currently, I'm a clinical product analyst at Blackford, uh, which is a strategic AI platform partner and solutions provider, which means that we aim to help healthcare organizations adapt an AI strategy by offering a wide selection of AI apps through our platform, including cardiology apps, of course. Uh, we will now continue with the panel. So, Victor, would you like to uh, go next? Hello. So, uh, thanks for the opportunity of being here and also to greet uh, all uh, the members of the panel. My name is Victor. I'm a cardiologist by training and the chief medical officer of AI format imaging. Um, and we are developing a, a, a smart uh, tool for the automatic um, uh, analysis of cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, thanks, Victor. Uh, uh, Dr. Murtaza, would you like to go next, please? Hi. Uh, thanks for arranging the meeting. This is Murtaza Nagavi. I'm the founder of HeartLong. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eva, would you like to go next, please? Hello, everyone. So my name is Eva. I'm from Vilnius, Lithuania. I am cardiologist, passionate about echocardiography. And as well, I am working in Ligens as chief medical officer. And we are developing the software that is dedicated for automated um, analysis of echocardiography images. Uh, Dr. Orit, would you please go next? Sure. My name is Omi Wimpanmer. I'm a radiologist and I'm chief medical officer of Nanox. Uh, and part of Nanox's platform is Nanox AI. We create artificial intelligence algorithm for population health screening. And we have products in cardi cardiology that we're going to speak about today, but also in osteoporosis screening and in fatty liver assessment. Thank you. Dr. Rioran, would you go next, please? Yes, so uh, my name is Joran Hemmel. I'm, I'm president and co-founder of, uh, of us 2 ai I have a long clinical background in doing echocardiography. So it's it's actually the field I, I originate from um, and I wanna have fun with echo. So um, that's where the, the company came in and, uh, and we're doing all the automation, getting rid of all the things that most sonographers don't wanna do, so. Uh, thank you all for the introductions and the uh, background. Uh, before we proceed further, I wanted to quickly present uh, the agenda for today. Uh, firstly, we will briefly cover the current challenges in cardiology, uh, discuss how AI is being used, uh, including uh, some of the success stories and findings. Uh, then we'll talk about the issues we come across around the adaption of AI and hopefully manage to answer some of the questions the audience might already have. Uh, then we'll touch upon uh, where we see AI heading towards and how it will shape the future of cardiology departments and the uh, workflows. Uh, so this brings to the first uh, agenda item, challenges in cardiology. I can briefly uh, begin by mentioning the obvious challenges that we see uh, today. Uh, so the number one being uh, work uh, workforce uh, shortages. Uh, currently, we have an acute shortage of trained uh, staff, which has inherently increased the workload and has led to hospital capacity constraints. Then we have challenges surrounding uh, integration of technology. You know, while there are advances being made in the technology and the uh, opportunities that arise from that, we still have uh, difficulties integrating these new technologies into the existing workflows. Uh, then the other very obvious uh, one is how to actively improve patient outcomes and improve uh, care. Uh, so let me turn to our panelists now. Uh, uh, Yoran, what are some of the challenges that you have come across that are maybe ultrasound or uh, echo specific? 
Yeah, the, the 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 obvious one that that you already mentioned, Rahil, is 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 the workforce, right? Um, you know, throughout my career in echocardiography, we have in my old hospital have always been looking for echo techs. And, you know, there, there was the need for a constant stream, but, you know, we, we couldn't get them. And that has, you know, influences on, on everything in that workflow. We're talking about um, waiting lists, simple thing, right? If, if, a, if a person has to wait for several weeks to get a simple echo, which I call a simple echo because it's, you know, it's such a powerful, uh, powerful tool to have for, for any doctor, but you do not have that 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 woman or that man to to you know do that echo you know then we're we're looking at a world that that we don't want to look at right so and this is where automation and ai specifically can do a lot of it uh thanks for that uh uh Orit, uh what are your experiences from a ct point of view so our company takes it from a different perspective. Um, we're focusing on cardiovascular disease, which is still the number one killer worldwide, even during the COVID pandemic. And yet people find out they have cardiovascular disease oftentimes with their first heart attack. In fact, 30 to 50% of patients find out they have chronic risk factors and chronic disease when they have their heart attack. These patients are walking around with this disease for many, many years beforehand. And a lot of those findings are available on CT scans that they're doing for other reasons. People are getting CT scans now for many, many reasons. The number of CT scans over the last 20 years has exponentially risen. And there's a lot of information on those CT scans that gets lost in the system. If we pull out the coronary calcium on those CT scans and automatically uh, assess the coronary calcium, provide Agustin scoring and categorization of patients, we can funnel the right patients to cardiologists. The cardiologist is a really advanced field with a lot of guideline-based therapy of how to treat patients with risk factors. If we can just get the patients with risk factors that we can see on the CT scans to the cardiologists who know what to do with those patients, uh, we can really make a very big impact in the number one killer across the world. So we're wanting to make healthcare better uh, by finding patients and treating them and make the cardiologists' lives easier because they know what to do. They just need to get the patients to do their job. Um, so hopefully it'll be a win-win from both sides. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Eva, you come uh, with an echo background too. Uh, so do you want to add something that uh, Yoran or Orit haven't uh, already added? So I absolutely agree what Yoran was telling about this, like a lot of like work that is not the one you would appreciate. <laughs> And I would like to add one more thing. Like there is another one challenge in echo, like high variability. There is really high vari variability between the same person, measurements of the same evaluation of the same person and also different evaluators. Uh, and the variability depends on different factors, uh, like um, the disease itself. There is a huge variety of different diseases in cardiology. From the experience of the cardiologist or sonographer from the quality of the images. Uh, so these are some of them. And I do see that AI can aid in each of the, these points and that would lead, lead to reduction in variability. Uh, thank you. Uh, Murtaza, would you uh, want to add something that uh, uh, Orit might have uh, already stated, so do you agree with some of those comments from Moret, or do you want to add something more, uh, because knowing that your product uh, has a more CT uh, focus? Yes, very much so. Uh, so she said, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer, which is true, and it's sad statistics, been around for over 50 years. Uh, so we're just adding at hardlung.ai a lung component. So Cardiovascular is his number one killer. Lung cancer is number one cancer and number two killer. And the two are united by one thing, HSCT scan. So as she said, there are millions of chest CT scans are done. Unfortunately, the majority of the information that is applicable and actionable for preventive care are ignored. So our AI goes to those scan, identifies 
like she said, calcium score, cardiac chambers, Alvey ball, um, hypertrophy, additional findings in the lungs that we've identified predictive of CVD and um, further back in the chest, uh, thoracic bone density and fatty liver and all that. So uh, you said, what is the challenge? The challenge is heart disease has been number one killer for decades and nothing has changed, even though we we make the best stents, the best catheter, the best interventional procedures, but that's like less than 5% of who could benefit. The rest of them, their first symptom is uh, in about half a sudden death. So about 400,000 sudden deaths, about 200. 25,000 of them outside of hospital. They just died before reaching an emergency room. That's the challenge that we hope with AI uh, we can change and overcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this, this uh, Victor, uh, this leaves us, uh, leaves us with uh, cardiac MR. So what are some of the challenges that you might, you might have experienced? Rahil, if you if you agree, I'll take the chance to summarize what uh, people have been saying here because we we share the same challenges. So one is, uh, I would say, the productivity and the workflow. So it takes a lot of time to report a single CMR exam, and we need help there. And that's what some of the people here are doing in their uh, 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 respective uh, uh, modalities. Then there's the inc inc incidental findings and the false positives and false negatives, and we can definitely help. And this challenge, challenge is really important and maybe critical, like Horit mentioned, for example, in the, in the calcium score. But we also benefit from this kind of approach in cardiac MR. And it, it's not uh, uncommon that we find, for example, an incidental lung node that turns out to be a, a cancer. And then there's also the challenge of uh, the inter-rater variability that has been uh, mentioned here because cardiology is very based in numbers and uh, we use numbers and sometimes hard numbers to make critical decisions. So we want to make sure that if I do a scan here in Portugal where I'm based or if I do in the West that we get the same results or at least that they converge in a minimum um, uh, range. Uh, and AI can definitely help there because this is also for me a significant challenge. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for sharing those challenges. We indeed uh, saw there are quite some similarities across the domains and across the different uh, fields of cardiology. Uh, so now let's move on to the next agenda item. Uh, how is AI being used at present? Uh, so Victor, let's continue our conversation that we had. Uh, so could you tell us a bit more about how your AI solution is tackling or addressing some of the challenges that you just uh, spoke about? Yes, so following uh, on my previous comment, so what we do is that we perform an automatic, fully automatic segmentation of the, of the, of the heart without any human interaction. And we use this uh, to integrate it seamless in the workflow. So what also happens uh, nowadays is that people have to move from different uh, softwares to do a single report. So how our software works on the background in the cloud, all the uh, workflow of the institution remains the same and we process the cases and we just report it to the physician. So this is the first approach we, we, we took and we are developing now tools that will also perform computer-aided diagnosis so that, uh, and this is already available in Europe, so that we also help physicians take the right decisions on the right diagnosis. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Joran, uh, could you share a bit about how uh, have users adapted your solution? Yeah, absolutely. So, so first off, then, you know, when you, when you talk to AI, everyone, you know, goes back and thinks, oh my goodness, AI is, but, but, what I really like, and, and and there was a there was a recent publication in the Journal of Echocardiography on this, was this one site who actually, you know, took the bull by the horns and 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 used AI and you know compared it to their normal manual workflow, and they simply said, okay, well, what happens if we do an echo? 
we do the image acquisition and then we sit behind a workstation and we, you know, we pick out all the labels, do all the annotations, which, you know, leads up to sometimes 250 clicks with, you know, come on, this is not, not out of this time anymore. Right. But what, what they actually found out is that if they implemented AI in a proper way in their workflow, they could actually reduce the, the measurement and reporting time with about 70%. So, you know, think about that 70% for a bit, right? Even if you're really conservative and you would say per machine, I can do one, maybe two echoes per machine per day extra, right? That leads up to 360 per machine. You know, small centers have only one echo machine, the a, a, a middle-sized uh, hospital will have four, five. So you get an immediate multiplier with, with AI. And if that AI actually also proves to be non-inferior to the humans measuring it, yeah, this, this, is, this is showing the true power of AI, basically. Yeah, thanks, Joran. Uh, uh, all right, uh, your AI solution focuses uh, more on the population health in initiative. Uh, how are the end users benefiting uh, from, from your solution? So we actually have two end users, if you think about it, right? Because you're screening the population for cardiac calcium and you're trying to identify patients and funneling them to the cardiologist for appropriate uh, risk assessment and treatment. So the clinician end user is really satisfied because suddenly they have a new revenue stream with a lot of new patients that need appropriate medical care. And now you get the patients to the right clinicians to really do the appropriate workup and treatment. 20% of those patients end up having to get interventional procedures. So it's a really clear um, revenue stream for the, for the clinicians. And we've already proven at several sites that they really have a return on investment that's six to 10 and sometimes even higher for the subscription of the, of the product. So that's a really easy a solution to implement because you're making money off of it with the new patients. But I'm a physician. I'm in here for the population health perspective of it. And I like to think of the patient as the end user. And if you find patients that don't realize they have cardiovascular disease, and we have numerous, numerous stories of, you know, the 48-year-old female who's been biking three times a week for the last 10 years and is absolutely certain she's in the most fit of health and she's female and no one's even thinking about cardiovascular risk in such a patient. And yet she happens to have a CT scan for a MBA and we find out she had moderate coronary artery calcification. She's really at moderate risk for a cardiovascular event. These are the types of patients that have sudden death out there in the field that we never get to treat. So the real end user is the patient because if we can save lives, I feel like I did my job because that's what I'm in here for. Uh, but the cardiologists need a little bit more financial incentives. So we're able to provide that for them as well. Thanks, thanks for it. Uh, Eva, how is your solution helping the end users and the patients? Okay, so I, as I was talking about variability, uh, so variability matters in, in echocardiography, and even 10% that matters, for example, but this 10% can be like done personally by me in the morning. I can like evaluate left ventricle function and say it's 25, and in the afternoon, I can say that it's 35 and not necessarily because it's it was some improvement, but it, it was because of my variability. So, um, and let's say I will I will give you an example. Uh, the doctor was having um, a patient with a bad left ventricle and he prescribed some medication and had follow-up visit after a few weeks and he did echo. And he saw like, okay, the ventricle improved like by 10%. But is it my, my error or is it truly an improvement? Is the treatment truly working? And he was he had doubts and think, was thinking maybe he need extra imaging, but he had an AI. And AI said uh, the evaluation, the number of AI was really close to his evaluation. So he felt more confident and okay. So AI can be not, uh, AI definitely can save the time reduce that workflow and save the time. And AI can be also like a digital colleague who can whisper you and give an advice uh, that you can be more, more um, confident with your decision and like practice. 
Yeah, I, I like that uh, digital colleague. <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, Murtaza, so your AI solution, as you hinted, uh, has an intention of bringing together cardiologists, pulmonologists, and radiologists. Uh, what has been the impact so far? Yes, and you can add endocrinologists. The first um, FDA clearance we received was auto BMD, our AI goes to the trabecular bone of a spinal column, identifies the area and reports bone density and uh, corresponding Z-score, T-score, which is the actual equivalent. That, uh, you probably know, osteoporosis is a major problem. Pretty much everybody after age 70 has some degree of osteoporosis. Those who are an accelerated path end up having fracture, in fact, in women, osteoporotic fracture uh, claim more uh, life and disability than heart attack, breast cancer together. Uh, so that's where the first solution came to use. And almost all of these patients are undetected by CT scans. Physicians don't have a way to report osteoporosis, C score, Z T score from a chest CT scan or abdominal CT scan. And currently, DEXA is less than 20% utilized for the population who need it. Obviously, for cardiac, we have, a, just like Orit said, calcium score is a low-hanging fruit. We just recently received FDA breakthrough designation. Our AI uses blood as contrast agent and is able to report the volume of cardiac chambers and for the first time, we demonstrated that LA volume measured by our AI predicts development of atrial fibrillation, not atrial fibrillation, development, like you will have AFib in about a year. And in our um, studies in MESA, a longitudinal NIH study, we showed that we were able to predict AFib and stroke within one year with an AUC of 0.84 with LA volume measured by our AI. Same thing for LV volume, we detect heart failure. So there is a number of things that will be launched as we go, but this is all just, um, you know, it's like the beginning of bringing AI uh, to patient care. Our goal is preventive care, and we uh, just recently launched AI CVD as a contender to the status quo. A status quo is just as risk factors, ASCVD risk factors, pooled cohort equation in the old Framingham risk score. So with adding a calcium score, you just get today only a calcium score, but we're going to give you a lot more, including bone density and improve patient care. So those are a list of items that are uh, on their way. Yeah, that, that's quite uh, insightful. Uh, great to hear that uh, AI is capable of uh, tackling some of these uh, challenges. Uh, so this brings us to the next uh, agenda item, uh, adoption of AI or challenges in uh, adoption of AI. Uh, or it, uh, have you experienced uh, worries from cardiologists or cardiac radiologists uh, that AI will replace them? How do you reassure them about uh, what AI can and cannot do. I think that that was kind of a concern years ago when people kind of first got introduced to AI and just didn't understand what the power of AI was or what it could do. I think with any new source of energy uh, over the course of the revolution, industrial and internet and all cloud-based, and every time you have a new opportunity, a new source of energy or power, you have to know how to use it properly. Um, and I think that ultimately medicine is not just a science, it's also an art. And everyone realizes that at this point, um, it, as, as the, uh, my colleague mentioned, a digital colleague to help you, uh, ability to have uh, a companion tool, ability to make radiologists and cardiologists just do their job better and more effectively, more accurately and get to more patients. I think people who are in the know and are, are familiar with AI are starting to use AI recognize that AI is an invaluable tool to make us better doctors. And, and ultimately, doctors are the ones who treat patients, and AI is just never going to be able to replace that. Yeah, that's uh, that's good to hear that uh, AI would 
be a companion rather than your competitor. So that's a uh, that's nice way to uh, put it. Uh, Eva, uh, have you had any use or concerns that AI would actually decrease their productivity rather than help them? Oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and to be sincere, I had such concerns myself. And I hear that concerns from the doctors around. Uh, but what I have noticed, once I or once other a challenge to challenge oneself or themselves when they give a try, the skepticism tends to decrease. So trying trying works to to like to gain more confident and to adopt this uh, to adopt AI. And one more thing what I think is important to like uh, to reduce that skepticism and worries is, like when we are doing any, I don't know, any test in our clinical work, we always have to know the limitations and strengths of the, uh, the test, what we can ex expect from each test. So the same thing is uh, with the AI modality. If the users, they know and they understand what they can get from exact modality and what they don't, that will reduce the concerns and like increase the confidence trust of the AI. Yeah. Uh, Murtaza, uh, there is uh, also a very common misconception that uh, incidental findings from an AI might actually increase workload or increase uh, pressure on the hospital system. How do you respond to such concerns? Well, it's not entirely misconception. Once you find something uh, which otherwise would go undetected until they become symptomatic in a very expensive, lethal condition, once you find them early, you have to do something about it. Um, for a long time, they were just referred to as incidental findings. Sometimes they were looked down as potential troublemaker. Now that we have AI that has the ability with more accuracy to identify and to monitor, our ability to manage the situation will be much better. Uh, we have to also look at this just like we would look at ourselves. If this was us and we went and got a calcium scan and we found a long nodule, we wouldn't just ignore it and say, well, this is an incidental finding we would want to know where it is in six months, in a year. And so that's, that's the approach that will need to be adopted. This is the part that has not been well developed because the guidelines of the last two, three decades, pre-AI era, were not tuned to managing disease and early detection and, and prevention. So with, with the AI CBD initiative, we're trying to bring that up we're trying to flag people with enlarged LA and LV to go get treatment before they become late stage disease. So there is some work need to be done, but that phobia or that kind of negative uh, connotation of accidental finding. In fact, if you go back years ago, they would put lead around the lung to not get scanned, just do a cardiac scan that's just embarrassing. So we, we want to just move the field beyond and use AI and technology to do what is needed, which is preventive care and prevention of uh, diseases. In the reference to, to your earlier point, we're not replacing radiologists. We're making more jobs for radiologists. They need to look at a lot of these because the FDA does not give us approval as a first reader and final reader. So just like the internet uh, revolution created more job for engineers, we're creating more job for physicians. That's a good thing to happen because this will all come at the cost of reducing late stage diseases and prevention of expensive diseases that you know has been the statistics for decades. So, uh, thank thanks uh, for for those uh, comments and also reassuring some of the uh, concerns out there. Uh, so this brings me uh, next to Victor. 
so Victor, during my own uh, research days, I spent hours drawing contours on Cine MR images. So I assume uh, there are a lot of people out there like me who are glad to have an automatic AI solution that does all these measurements and contouring for them. Do you experience any resistance from the uh, from the users uh, with your AI uh, solution? Rahil, uh, so what happens is that the first time you talk about AI, people get a bit reluctant. I think it was more common in the past uh, because there was this feeling of, of replacement that clearly is not the the intended outcome and and won't be and won't be for the reasons that my colleagues already mentioned. So the moment people start using, they understand the potential. And Rahil, I'm sure that when you started, you were feeling a bit special that you knew how to draw the contours. But after a while, you were already bored of the time you spent draw, just you know drawing uh, uh, some contours around the heart because it doesn't make sense to lose the time with that. So what we feel in the what we feel in the in the in the field is that people sometimes may be a bit reluctant, but the moment they try the software, they understand the potential, how it will increase their productivity. That uh, reluctancy goes away, and people are willing to to jump on and usually what happens is that people want more you know so they start to use we have this feature and they start asking for different features for uh, uh, new uh, iterations of the product so it's quite stimulating when we are talking with people and understanding how things change fast and how the perspective of people can change so fast and like uh, people mentioned before we are here to enhance to help and not to replace uh, thanks uh, victor uh, what about you, uh, Yoran? Uh, do you see any gaps in workflows or infrastructure that might uh, make adaption of AI particularly challenging? Yeah, so so the the the, the thing Fitter mentioned, it, right? The the reluctance to to you know pass by your normal workflow that you're accustomed to. This this stuff is scary to many people, huh? And but but if you you know if you step back and 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 look at many of the older workflows, it's it's actually quite quite inefficient. Uh, we still encounter hospitals where they're manually inputting data, right? Which which you know is kind of kind of an issue. Another thing is is you know in previous hospitals or in other hospitals where you see people tend to cherry pick the machines, for example, their echo machines. One has, you know, we have three GE machines, we have two Philips machines and a, and a 4G, we, we have everything. But, you know, getting a good comparison between between those machines is, is you know, difficult. So you need vendor agnostic solutions for, for that. And this is, again, where AI comes in. Another thing is, and this is the funny thing about this group altogether, we are from different modalities. And what we want to do in every hospital and, 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 you know, patients and doctors will benefit from it is, you know, combine all that information, right? Combine information you get from CTs, combine information that you, we have all that data readily available. We're all smart people here. We gather that data, but, you know, combining it that, that, you know, drives the need for more computing power and, and et cetera. And this is again, where AI comes in. The only thing that is, Holding us back is actually, you know, embracing it and 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 putting that step forward. I think. Thanks uh, for that. Mm, so this uh, has been some uh, amazing conversations. Uh, we are almost at the end of our webinar and brings us to our last agenda item: uh, the future of AI in uh, cardiology. Uh, Murtaza, what are your thoughts about uh, the future? Uh, well, um, you know, the best way to predict future is to create it. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so we are, as I said, uniting radiologists, pulmonologists, uh, somewhat endocrinologists, using a common uh, tool, the chest CT scan, from here to here, it's about 75% of mortality. And if we were able to identify risk early, 
provide actionable information, make it easy and super convenient, say, you know, a hundred dollar or so type scan available when you go to your um, weekend grocery uh, shopping in the parking lot, you hop in and out less than five minutes and we give you the kind of information that currently is not available, even with radiologists sitting there for hours, they can do that, measuring cardiac chambers volume and LV wall mass and aortic calcification and lung nodules, all of that. So that's really is the promise of the AI. And if we're successful, we hope to uh, dent the number one, number two killers that have been around for a decade. So. Uh, that's our goal, uh, prevention, early detection. In my view, um, this is like an information technology challenge. It's not a medical challenge. It's not medicine. It's just lack of information. If you have a long nodule, and you don't know. If you have calcium loaded in your coronaries or your LA volume is popping and you don't know, we have the technology. There's nothing new needs to be developed. It's just been around for a long time. AI can enable us to bridge this gap of information so you would have that information. And I'm sure, like most of us, other people, even though they're not doctors, once they know and they see an AI-enabled tool that shows them their risk, they will take actions. So that's the gap uh, I think we need to address. And if we do, hopefully we can... Uh, significantly impact um, life expectancy from the top number one, number two killer. Of course, osteoporosis and the fatty liver and all other things are uh, included. Uh, thanks, uh, Murtaza, for that uh, answer. I'm aware that you have other pressing uh, matters and you have to uh, uh, he head out. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, being part of this uh, conversation. Uh, so to keep this conversation moving, uh, let me uh, now uh, uh, direct my next question to Eva. Eva, where do you see us uh, heading towards? So as we started that there is increased demand of echo, uh, but not sufficient resources, um, I see that this is the reason why AI will be definitely in our clinical practice. And I do see another perspective that uh, what also studies shows that non-cardiologists can be empowered to do echo with AI, like to do uh, screening, uh, screening some basic images to detecting main basic huge things like to see an elephant in the room or to do follow-up visits. Uh, that, ca that can be done by non-cardiologists. So um, AI is the solution that might help to empower other physicians to use that modality to reduce that um, increased demand and to aid in patient care. So I believe that um, ECHO with AI might be democratized. Yeah, interesting uh, thoughts. Uh, thanks, uh, Eva. Uh, Victor, uh, where do you see AI applications for uh, cardiac MR moving towards in the uh, near to far future? So I'll take the word that Eva just mentioned, democratize. That's how we see the mission of AI for, CM, AI for Med and AI for CMR. So if you take together the AI that is being used on the acquisition, reducing the acquisition time of a cardiac MR, and if you join that with the power of softwares like AI for CMR, you can really, really democratize AI, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance, and that will be of great benefit as this technique is being more and more used and indications are uh, getting uh, uh, more as uh, the evidence that starts to, to accumulate uh, of the benefits of cardiac MR, usually on top of echo. It's not also competitive. It's not also uh, uh, techniques that compete uh, with each other. So that, that's what I envision on the near and medium future. On the long term, uh, I think that also from a researcher uh, perspective, 
it will be interesting to you to, to understand how we can use the raw data of the images to incorporate uh, in the algorithms and to make sure that we use all the information we have uh, in the decision making process. But this is yet to be done. Uh, also from the scientific perspective, but that's how we envision the future and where we intend to go. Oh, thanks, Victor, for that. Uh, Yuran, uh, we've already had some discussions where, uh, you know, we've spoken about AI improving efficiency and also AI reducing uh, intervariability between the operators. Uh, what else do you think uh, the future might have uh, for uh, for AI and uh, ECHO? Yeah, so, 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 you know, I'm, I already have the feeling I li I'm living the future here, right? And and there's still so much more to come. Um, um, you know, just to give you a simple example, not so long ago, I saw a robot arm doing doing the acquisition of, of an Echo. The thing I, you know, I got trained for over the years. And, and, and you see that, and obviously, you know, there's things to still tweak, but but it it you know it has the level of an office it's the same thing eva said you know we can train people with ai enable them with ai to go out into the world into healthcare deprived regions and do echoes for us you know we have to realize that that all that power can actually be put there for good right go to africa somewhere where you know in the middle of the jungle train someone to do the basic echoes, you know, utilize them with scan assist, utilize them with, with the AI for analysis of echo, and actually, you know, give them that 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 access to 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 such a tool. Again, I'm I'm repeating myself, but echo is such a cool tool, right? It's it's easy and it should be accessible. It's not, and with AI, we actually have the tools to make it accessible. So. Come on, guys. Let let let's go. Let's do this stuff, right? The future is now in that sense. I think. Yeah, uh, interesting uh, thoughts, and yeah, of course, uh, it would be great to have uh, uh, accessible healthcare and uh, ultrasound and other cardiac uh, MRIs, uh, other cardiac uh, solutions. You know, being uh, helping uh, the patients and the people. Uh, or at uh, any closing remarks from your side, uh, perhaps from a patient point of view, what might a future look like for the patient and how AI might benefit uh, them? I think there's a lot of work being done to increase longevity of patients, but uh, increasing their quality of life is also important. And so if you identify these chronic risk factors early on, we really have a way to kind of intervene and treat patients so that they can live longer, but also healthier lives. Who We want to live longer. We want to be healthy, though. We don't want to be disabled. So these chronic conditions like cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis and, and liver disease, we can find them earlier. We can treat them earlier. Right now, there's a big problem in much of the world, uh, as you all mentioned, about health inequities. There are some populations getting a lot of very good health care and a lot of preventative health care, and there are many, many populations that are not. If you standardize a way of screening the population, you have an ability to start making a dent in that and start improving the health inequities that are so rampant across the world in general. And even within, you know, small United States, even within one city in the United States, there are big disparities. And using the images that are created anyways, population screening tools like this can really find the patients, pull them into the healthcare system, and direct them to preventative healthcare, and that way we could all enjoy living longer and healthier lives. Uh, thanks, Sorek, for those uh, thoughts. Uh, so this brings us to the end of our uh, webinar, and we've covered all the agenda items that we uh, sort of uh, that we started off with. Uh, so I'd also like to thank all the uh, uh, audiences who have attended our web webinar, and would like to say a special thank you to all our panelists for being here and sharing some of your uh, uh, some of your user experiences what uh, the AI can do and also setting some uh, uh, future in perspective thank you thank you all thank you